Glad you covered uh, and, and while we're talking. Okay, today we have Mr. John McCaskill. Um, he is going to be talking about developing resilience through mindfulness. We are all going to run into obstacles. How we handle those obstacles and the life we live after running into them can and will define us. Equipping yourself early and often allows us to not only bounce back, but to thrive and to thrive, not in spite of these obstacles, but because of them. And uh, today we have John McCaskill, who is a Navy, a retired Navy SEAL commander. Uh, he graduated from the United States Naval Academy. Uh, he served in Iraq, Afghanistan, off the coast of Somalia and in Panama. Um, he became the, the deputy executive director and podcast host and producer for Veterans Path. And he now owns his own mindfulness consulting company, McCaskill Consulting LLC, bringing mindfulness and meditation to high performing teams to aid in dealing with stress, anxiety, and depression, all while increasing focus, creativity, and productivity. He also is a husband and a proud father of two and one on the way. Welcome, right. John. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so, so honored to be here with you and, and the crew. Uh, I think it's great. This is, uh, this is not an opportunity I have regularly. Uh, I've gone on some podcasts, you know, talking to the host, and that's all well and good. And I very much enjoy that. But I love having a live audience here that I can engage with. And I love being able to share my story. And I can't wait to hear everyone else's. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll tell a little bit about what you just covered there. And I'd love to jump into an active conversation about that. So um, as, as Sarah mentioned, served in the Navy for, for a while, did 24 years in the Navy, 17 of your, of that was with the SEAL teams. And prior to that, uh, I, I'll, I'll back it up all the way, actually. I was born in South Africa, um, moved to the States um, almost, let's see, 35, 36 years ago, and um, grew up in a small town of Ruston, Louisiana. My family, I have three older sisters and a younger brother. My parents had brought us over here, um, one, to escape apartheid, which is what was still going on in South Africa at the time. And the second piece was uh, to avoid conscription as they didn't want my, my brother and myself to be drafted into the military. So the joke with my dad now is that we dodged the draft, but I came over here and volunteered <laughs> to join the US military and then served for 24 years. I remember clearly I enlisted first and I went to the Navy recruiter, I turned 18. Uh, my senior year, the beginning of my senior year, and I went and, and signed up for the delayed enlistment program and without my father. <laughs> I came home and I was like, yeah, I enlisted in the Navy today. And it's like, uh, what? Uh, you probably should have spoken to me about that first. I was like, I'm 18 years old. <laughs> I'm, I'm big and blown, right? <laughs> Little did I know. But anyhow, enlisted in the Navy after, uh, after senior year, and then went to the Naval Academy uh, after a year of being enlisted, and then from there went out to SEAL training and did the did the rest of my career. But the the what what I want to talk to you about specifically today is that resilience and developing that resilience because so many of us, when we picture you know uh, special operations or the military as a whole, we picture these um, tough and um, impenetrable people, some people without feelings, superheroes almost. And we, we here in this, in this room today know better than that. We know we're all human beings. We know we have feelings, emotions, and we can do really good things, but we can also make mistakes or obstacles or adversity can come into our lives. And that's that's what happened in in my career and i'm sure it's happened in, in all of our careers in all of our lives right and if we enable ourselves to bounce back from that that's when we're going to end up thriving there's a great book the obstacle is the way by ryan holiday talks about that very thing is that seeing obstacles and adversity as opportunities to grow rather than seeing them as obstacles or adversity and actually thriving after going through those obstacles or around those obstacles or over those obstacles, figuring it out, whatever, however you get around just to the other side, 
thriving after that and, be, and because of that, not in spite of it. Uh, and it's a really interesting way to attack life. So some of the things that, uh, that I won't say went wrong in my career or my life, but some of the things that I didn't expect uh, you know, which I probably should have going into the military. My, my first deployment, we lost a lot of guys, lost a lot of good friends. Um, and I, I battled with survivor guilt after that and took a while to get past that obstacle uh, years, almost like a decade and a half, almost to get past that. And I wasn't equipped to overcome that obstacle until I was introduced to mindfulness and meditation. So if you don't know anything about me, that's, that's why I told Sarah to take that breath at the beginning. And that's what I do now is I teach the mindfulness and meditation. And Sarah touched on it a little bit there with McCaskill Consulting, which I've got to change that to doing business as something else because McCaskill Consulting is so boring. <laughs> but I got, to, I got to get something more exciting than that. But anyhow... Uh, now I teach mindfulness and meditation because it really changed my life. That survivor guilt that I battled with, um, it sent me down some really dark paths. I had some really dark thoughts, um, ended up battling with that stress and the anxiety and the depression. And the Navy put me on different medications for that. And that definitely helped with the stress and the anxiety and the depression. But what it also did was completely numb me to any enjoyment. So I wasn't enjoying life at all. So basically, I was just going through life as an empty shell of who I had been before. And I wasn't sure, sure I'd ever get back to where I was. So um, I was, like I said, having those dark thoughts, both because the depression and also I felt, you know what, those guys, they had died on the battlefield. Why did I deserve to be here? their wives, their sons and daughters, their mothers and fathers, their brothers and sisters had lost them. Why am I still here? <clears throat> um, so I cont continued having those dark thoughts and I finally went to a, a counselor and some of the talk counseling was helping, um, but one counselor in particular recommended that I try out mindfulness and meditation. And uh, you know, I wrote about this a couple of months back and, and even writing about it was cathartic. But in, in my write-up, I, I mentioned this, that I laughed at the guy at first. I was like, hey, do you know what I do for a living? I'm, I'm in special operations. You know, I can't be telling my friends, my buddies, that I, that I meditate. Because in my mind, meditation was kind of this woo-woo practice. Um, weak, for, for lack of a better term right now, is kind of a, a weak practice um, for the weak of mind. When in actuality, it was completely opposite. And this guy, this counselor was fantastic. I need to find him at some point. But anyhow, um, he sat me down and he's like, okay, well, these are, look at this list of very high performing individuals. You know, and he showed me like 10 or 15 people. And I was like, wow, yeah, I want to be like them. He's like, well, you know what they do? They all meditate. Every single one of them, they meditate, they have a practice. And he couched it, he reframed practicing mindfulness and meditation as something that was going to improve my performance. And as a special operator, as a military type A personality, that's something we're always looking for, something that's going to give us an edge over the enemy or give us an edge over our buddy right next to us, you know, <laughs> you know, whether that's mentally or physically or whatever, we always want an edge over our buddy. I think actually we want that edge over our buddy more so than the edge over our enemy. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> When he comes to like that, I was like, okay, well, I can, I can, I can do this. I can start practicing. So I started practicing for about two weeks and I'm sure you guys have heard this because uh, I've told this to a lot of you, a lot of you here, I've told this very story to you. Uh, I started practicing for about two weeks and I went uh, back to this counselor and I was like, dude, that stuff is not working. So what else do you have? And he's like, well, that's like going to the gym for two weeks and thinking that you're going to come out looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You got to put in some time. You got to put in some effort, allow the changes to happen. Um, and that's when I was like, Oh, uh, okay. I'll eat some humble pie and I'll go back and practice for a little bit longer. So I practiced for uh, probably another eight weeks, just something simple. I mean, I downloaded an app on my phone, started super simple um, and then work my way up to a little bit longer uh, meditations. And that's, you know, after about eight weeks or so, I started to see differences in how I was talking with people, how I was feeling, how I was communicating, what gave me anxiety, what caused me stress, what caused depression. 
the stress and anxiety and depression were still there, but I was able to process it and understand why it was there and understand that it was an instance of stress, an instance of anxiety and an instance of depression. And that wasn't meaning that John McCaskill is anxious. It didn't mean John McCaskill is depressed. It meant that I was going through that particular emotion. And <clears throat> that changed everything. It changed the way that I was living. It changed the way that I was performing. Um, and I thought for a moment that it was just some type of uh, placebo effect. And a buddy of mine came up to me. He's like, hey, what are you doing differently? Because you you look different. You're speaking more clearly. You're, you're uh, less angry at work because <laughs> there's anger there too, right? And uh, I was like, hmm, do I tell this guy what I've been doing? Uh, so I, I stepped out on a ledge and I was like, well, I've, I've been meditating and practicing mindfulness. And that's being present in the here and now, paying attention to the present moment without any judgment. That's what mindfulness is. And uh, what I expected was this kind of glazed over look and then seeing the back of his head and probably never having another word with this guy. But what I got rather was, oh, what? Well, tell me more about that. How did you get into that? And, you know, I told him and then he started his own practice. And then, you know, another person came up and then eventually they're like, hey, we should all do a practice at work together. We did a, we did a couple of practices at work. And then I realized, you know what? This is what I want to do. We're talking about transition, talking about, you know, the military transition that many of us here have gone through or will go through. That's what I decided that I wanted to do. I wanted to help others um, live their best lives, their most fulfilled lives. And by teaching mindfulness and meditation, I could do that. And so coming back full circle to the whole resilience piece, that that obstacle uh, of losing my, my, my brothers on the battlefield, um, I was able to bounce back 15 years later, <laughs> right? So that doesn't seem super resilient. But then uh, since I've been introduced to mindfulness and meditation, I've had various obstacles thrown at me. Um, uh, I'll be completely vulnerable here with you on, on this call. I, I ended up getting in trouble in the Navy uh, after, after I put on 05 and I got selected to command an element. Um, I got in trouble because my sister's husband at the time was battering her. And I called him, uh, didn't get him on the phone, so I sent him a barrage of texts that were basically threatening him that if he laid another hand on my sister, that I was going to pay him a visit. And, uh, and I got brought up on electronic harassment charges for that. And prior to learning about mindfulness and meditation, I would have been like, oh, there goes my career. I'm done. I'm a horrible person. I'm a stupid person. You know, all this negative self-talk. And Abigail, I know you, you've you got those purple threads. Those purple threads were going like crazy in my life. Uh, I was talking negatively about myself to myself, but I, or I could have. But luckily, I had the mindfulness meditation and I sat down. And I was like, okay, where am I? Where can I go? What can I do? And where's my family? Is my family safe? Are they provided for? And I saw... And, you know, Sarah, you tuned into the Men Talking Mindfulness podcast prior to this. Last week, we talked about gratitude and how that can change your, your mindset. Well, that, that meditation and then showing gratitude for what I had, not what I had lost, that allowed me to bounce back that much quicker from that incident. And then since then, you know, I've had nothing where I got in trouble, but I still had life obstacles like we all do. I've been able to bounce back from those because I have the tools so for those of you on the call today, if you haven't ever tried mindfulness and meditation, I highly encourage it because it can and will change the way you live your life, the way you see things in life. And honestly, it's going to make you a, a more fulfilled person and you're going to experience this, this thing, this journey that we call life in a much more clear way. A much more enjoyable way. So that's that's my story. That's how I got from where I was to where I am. And uh, I guess I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. 
John, thank you. Thank you so much. You, you really do have a great spirit. I, I, I'm i sure everybody on here feels that too. I mean, especially with your job resume and the story um, that I don't know if you all read his story, uh, but oh my gosh, what you had gone through. So listen, I'll just kick it off and then please everybody else, um, you know, ask, ask questions, ask your questions. You know, one thing that hit me after I read your story is, first of all, I could not imagine that how intense that was to lose so many uh, friends. And, but what I, I thought was John definitely was intuitive. Like there was something in you that sense, like, this is not a good idea. And that you actually had the courage to I would imagine you went very much against the grain and I, I don't want to go down another rabbit hole that you don't want to go down, but, but I, I just thought it's very interesting perspective. It's very interesting with, you know, a military trained person and a civilian as a civilian, as I was reading your story, I thought he definitely has a strong intuition and the courage to follow that. And, and possibly that is why he is here today. And then again, you connecting into this mindfulness, it really does give you a spirit that really stands out from many of your brothers and sisters in special operations, just because you have been able to connect into that. So I can imagine that your, your work buddy saw that in you that, wow, something has definitely changed here. So, so thank you right. for sharing. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And yeah, just for, for those of you who are here uh, who have not read that story, uh, basically, um, I, I wrote a story about what had happened in Operation Red Wings. Um, originally, um, Michael Murphy, Murph, had been, <clears throat> uh, he and I had been alternating operations, surveillance from Constance operations. And it was my turn to lead this one particular operation. And the the planning had gone poorly. The, uh, the area that we had sent guy or we were planning on sending guys into was an area where we had lost marines just the week before uh i think i think they had lost 17 marines that same area the week before or something to that effect it was just it was just ugly it was ugly right and i had decided um that not i had decided but i, I had realized that it was poor planning risk was severely outweighing what we were going to get out of it it wasn't a national mission target or anything to that effect and uh and i voiced my concerns and so murph ended up taking that mission instead of me they ended up doing the mission murph ended up getting killed on that mission along with two other guys on the ground and then 16 other guys in the helicopter that was called in for a quick reaction force so as you can well imagine, a lot of thoughts entered my mind in, I sent Murph to his death, right? That's kind of what, those are the thoughts that I told myself. I should have been the one who died instead of Murph. Murph should have been here, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll also tell you, Sarah, I'm surprised at how many uh, men and women in the special operations community are, are fairly intuitive uh and and will voice their concerns and I, and i don't think i was the only one that voiced concerns of, of that that mission as a matter of fact i know i wasn't danny deets came up to me uh that that night before they inserted danny was one of the guys who was killed on the ground and danny was like hey hey boss this is this one i'm scared about i remember him clearly telling me and he had never like never broken that armor before never showed that chink in his armor before but he he was vulnerable to me right then he was like i'm scared i i don't know i don't feel good about this one and there was reason to um so we won't go down the rabbit hole of you know all the the planning and the shenanigans and the mishaps that happened in that operation but bottom line um i attribute that that operation to me being here today and um and one person on that uh story that i shared when i, I wrote it they're like, hey, you're living for more than just yourself now. So that one, and I think I told Abigail this when we spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago, writing that article, I wrote that for myself, um, basically an exercise in catharsis. And then uh, I read it to my wife and it was the first time she had 
she didn't even know the details of that. And I read it to her and I couldn't make it through, you know, two or three sentences of, uh, without crying. And so that, that reading it out loud was cathartic again. And then she was like, well, you should publish that. And so I did, I published it first on LinkedIn and then I put, put it on Thrive Global. Um, and, and Chris, actually, I, I attribute Chris to sharing it recently because it was on Thrive and then, uh, and not a whole lot of folks saw it. And then Chris pu- uh, uh, posted on it and it got a ton of folks. And actually, I think after that post is when somebody contacted me and they're like, hey, you're living for them now as well. It's kind of like that scene at the end of uh, Saving Private Ryan uh, when the, the, when that one guy's like Tom Hanks, the main character, right? He's saying, earn this, earn this. Well, that's what I feel I have to do every day. That's why I, I do what I do is I'm passionate about sharing these practices with others so that they can live a better life. And so that there's a reason for my being here still. So, so I rambled on that for quite a while. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? So I'd like to ask a question, but I want to say something before I do, you know, uh, John, you are amazing. I'm fortunate to know you. I am so proud of you. I'm proud that you consistently put yourself in courageous and uncomfortable positions uh, to learn more about yourself and to share that with others. And uh, you're an amazing human, a brother, thought partner. I love you. I love you too, sister. Yeah. Um, Can you share a little bit? uh, When we talked about this before, you talked about what um, turned you on to mindfulness and meditation. You talked about that a little bit. And you said one of the things that convinced you to give it a try was the science behind it. Can you talk a little bit about the science and how it changes oh, yeah. your brain. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm about to nerd out Karen. So watch out. Oh, brother, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have my, my degree in mathematics and my master's degree in operations research. So I'm a data guy. I'm a numbers guy. I'm a science guy. <clears throat> so when this stuff started to work for me, <laughs> I had to read up on why it was working. And the reason is, is that our brains, our bodies have not evolved as fast as society has. And we are still wired very similarly to the way that our, our ancient cavemen and cave women ancestors are. That they have, the amygdala is the part of our brain which reacts in the fight or flight reaction. That's wired to protect us, right? So when, <clears throat> the cavemen and women were going out with their clubs to get food and they had to protect themselves from a saber toothed tiger that was around the corner. One, they had a negativity bias that was built into them. That negativity bias was assuming that there's a saber toothed tiger around the corner of every corner or behind every single bush. And by assuming that and them being wrong, they lived. If they had it wired the other way around with the positivity bias, they would assume that there is no saber tooth tiger. And then as soon as they're wrong, they die. So that's what the the amygdala was there to put us into that fight or flight reaction or response um, quite often whenever there's a threat or or a perceived threat. Now, what we do is we perceive this as a threat. We perceive notifications, social media, emails, all these things we're perceiving as threats and our bodies are reacting just like they did when we assumed there was a caveman or sorry, we assumed there was a saber tooth tiger around the corner and we're going into that red over and over every day, living in that red zone. And by practicing mindfulness and meditation, what we do all the time, we'll have people tell us, hey, I can't meditate. I'm one of those people who my mind races all the time. I can't meditate. I was one of those people, right? I sat down for my first two minute breathing drill. And within like five seconds, my mind was thinking, wow, I'm wasting time or I could be doing this or that. And by by thinking one, by thinking that you can't meditate, you're setting yourself up for failure. But then you can, everybody can meditate. It just takes time. It takes more time than others for others. Um, So sat down, 
meditate, your mind starts wandering off. When you come back to the anchor, that anchor is your breath, a body scan, whatever the case may be. Every time you come back, you're doing, if you can envision like a mental push up or a mental repetition, you're actually rewiring your brain every time you come back. So when people say, well, my mind wanders when I meditate, I'm like, well, that's a good thing. That's what your mind is meant to do. Your mind is built to wander. Just like your heart is built to beat, your mind is built to think thoughts. So don't beat yourself up. Just notice it, notice that it's wandered off and then bring it back to the anchor. And every time you do that, that's the rewiring that happens. And what the rewiring that happens is you're developing new neural pathways that respond rather than react. So now, rather than reacting with the amygdala and the, the <clears throat> sympathetic nervous system, you're responding. So respond versus react. You're going to be responding with the prefrontal cortex. The, the prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that is meant that that is there for rational thought. So you're going to be thinking more rationally more often. So you're going to be making response instead of react part of your life. And you, and you can tap into that parasympathetic nervous system or the rest and digest. So you've got the sympathetic, which is the fight, flight, or freeze, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. And you can do that. Like if I was to just suddenly start yelling at the screen and yelling at all of you, your heart rates would go up. You would react to that. That's your sympathetic nervous system kicking in to protect you from this weirdo who's yelling at you from a Zoom screen. Uh, but then if you just take a second, and like I said, Sarah, at the beginning, just take that breath. Taking a breath can bring your heart rate down. It can bring your respiratory rate down. It can bring your blood pressure down. The sweating that happens in your hands goes away. The tension that you feel in your shoulders and your forehead, your back, that can go away. So that's some of the science behind why mindfulness and meditation work. Uh, but it does take time. You, you could sit down for a single meditation meditate for five minutes and feel better in the moment and walk away from that and get into traffic and get stressed out because somebody cut you off. Um, and that's sure that it didn't last. And then you're like, well, this meditation stuff's not working, but over time that five, 10 minutes of relief that you get after meditation spreads more and more. And over about two months, it's, it's been shown it's about two months you can start having lasting effects so that when you do meditate and you go out into traffic, somebody cuts you off. You one, you don't react, you respond. And two, you have more compassion for that person that cut you off. You, you suddenly start seeing them as human beings with their own lives. And you don't sit there and say, Hey, jerk, you cut me off. You, you like have compassion for that person. Maybe they're driving to the hospital really fast. They cut you off because they have a you know, a, a child in their, their child seat that needs to get to the hospital and it's an emergency. And you start seeing things completely differently. And because you start seeing things differently, you process things more differently, you process things differently. And ultimately that's where the long-term lasting effects happen. So that's, uh, that's the science behind it. It's very interesting. That, that was really well said. I, I don't think I've <laughs> heard that that clearly before. Explain that clearly. And Good. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to be like a show and tell or, or model. You know, <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Can I ask a question? Oh. Yes. Who won? Did I win the race? All right, great. So, hey, it's Chris in Japan. Um, so, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for coming in here, John, and being so vulnerable. I think it, it gives permission to the room to, to be vulnerable when the when the tough team guys telling us things like that. So, um, and thanks for, um, for making me cry this morning. I had no intention of crying when I came in here, <laughs> definitely teared up a little when you're, when you're talking about, uh, the earn this, cause I just, um, was thinking some of that same, those same thoughts. Um, and it's, it's difficult to reframe things sometimes, but I think, uh, uh, the things that put me on the path of mindfulness, like, didn't happen to me now looking back on it that they happened for me you know in order to get where I am today and what I'm doing today so um so I know mindfulness meditation um for me it seems to be the the foundation of my wellness practices but I do a lot of other things too and I was wondering if uh perhaps you could talk a little bit about some of the other things you do to keep you 
grounded, centered, and driving on. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, that's going to set me up, Chris. I, I, I could have called you and asked you to ask that question. <laughs> I'm actually, uh, I'm in the process of <laughs> Uh, I'm in the process of writing some uh, some keynote speeches um, so that I can follow in Abigail's uh, public speaking <laughs> role. Um, and, and then, like I mentioned earlier this week, Sarah, so that I can enter that white collar crime that General Petraeus mentioned. So, <laughs> so anyhow, um, one of my keynotes is on tipping over the first domino. And if you've ever read uh, The One Thing, it talks about identifying uh, a a domino that you can knock over and set that whole thing in motion, right? Uh, so if you start meditating, let's say, that's, that's my first domino, let's say, for example, that allow me to experience life more fully, enjoy life. One of the examples that I always share when I'm talking about where mindfulness really made a change for me was with my daughter. When she was like three months old, I would get up in the middle of the night, feed her a bottle. And as soon as I'm feeding her that bottle, because I'm up, I may as well be thinking, right? So one, I'm ruminating on something that I had messed up in the past, or I'm having some severe anxiety about something that's going to happen tomorrow at work, something that's due next week at work, some bill that I haven't paid, whatever the case may be. My mind is on everything except the beautiful little miracle that was right there in my hands. After practicing for about two months, that's where I really noticed the difference. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, actually look forward to it, go in there, pick up my little girl, give her a bottle and pay attention to the little noises that she was making, her breathing, her reaching up and you know grabbing my hands with her tiny little hands and just being in awe of this beautiful miracle that was right there with me. And then I'd put her back in her crib and I would go back to sleep. I'd go back to my bed and go back to sleep. Whereas before I would go back to my bed and just stew about all that stuff that had entered my mind while I was feeding her. And then I wouldn't go back to sleep. And then the next day I would feel awful because I hadn't slept well. So one, now I'm, I'm behind the power curve right off the bat. I go to work. I don't do well at work because I'm tired. Now, because I'm tired, I'm making poor decisions and I'm communicating poorly. I'm making poor decisions at work. I'm making personally poor decisions, like eating like trash, right? Oh, there's a donut. Sure, I'll eat that because I'm tired and I'm hungry. Now, fast forward to where I'm practicing, get up in the middle of the night, feed my baby girl, love it, go back to bed, fall asleep, go into work, recharged, ready to attack the day, start making better decisions at work, start eating better start drinking more water, right? My, my big jug right here. I'm showing it for you, Karen, right here. <laughs> so, you know, I'm making better decisions. So that was the first domino that I tipped. But um, the, the reason I tell you all that, Chris, is I'm trying to eat better. And by trying to eat better, a lot of the time I fail. But when I meditate and I sleep well, then I make better decisions. And then eating better is easy. Once I'm eating better, then drinking water is easy. Cutting out some of the trash is easy. Going to bed at a regular time is easy. Going to the gym now because I'm not as tired, that's easy. Now because I went to the gym, I get, I get energy and it just continues to feed on itself. So those are some of the things, but it all boils down to identifying whatever that first domino is that you need to knock down to knock all the rest of them down so that you can start feeling better and being better. Wow. Thanks, John. Hey, that's great. That's okay. Hey, John, this is Jake. Uh, hey, Jake. That was beautiful. That was beautiful, man. That was, that, that was like exactly where I wanted to go with my question. Could you right cover on. it earlier? Um, I had a guy on my podcast recently talking about how discipline, sometimes it only takes a little bit of discipline to create the habit, which is really what we need to get that thing that we want. So like, and you kind of talked about it with the first two weeks of your mindfulness and saying, ah, I don't know if this is it. I don't know if this is working, but what, what advice can you give us out there to help support our teams, our families for helping create these habits with patience and with, I guess, also the, the verbal explanations, you picking the right words, picking the right body language. What kind of mm. recommendations can you help us with as a teams and family development? 
Yeah, great question, Jake. And I'm I'm still learning that. So, you know, I've got a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And, and like Sarah mentioned uh, at the in the intro, I've got number three on the way. So I just got my four-year-old out of diapers and, and I'm going to have another one in diapers soon. Um, so anyhow, uh, I think that the 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 way that you teach and and your you spend time with your family, it all all boils down to compassion. And I mentioned that touched on it earlier is if you're practicing compassion, if you're being compassionate, you see other people, you see the struggles that they're going through, whether that's a struggle of somebody cutting you off on the road and realizing, you know what, maybe they're driving really fast for a reason, or whether it's your two-year-old that's pitching a fit because he didn't get the right toy, you kind of identify and be compassionate. And one of the my favorite things to watch about compassion is, uh, is anything Brene Brown I love. If you check out Brene Brown, she's got a great TED Talk. She's got a great Netflix, obviously got some great books. But specifically about compassion, empathy, and sympathy, she goes into the differences between, between those two. And, and so many times, so many times people think they are the same thing. Where sympathy is, she has a great analogy. Uh, you you walk in, you walk up, and you see somebody that's fallen down in a hole, and you look down in that hole. You're like, oh, that sucks. That's sympathy, right? Whereas empathy is, you walk by and you see that person stuck down in the hole. You're like, oh, let me crawl down there in there. And you crawl down in the hole, and you you look you look around. You're like, wow, this does suck because now you're experiencing the feelings. Compassion that's where the magic happens. Compassion is taking it one step further. That's experiencing the feelings that somebody else is feeling and then wanting to do something about it. And I think that's where we have to be in order with our families, with our colleagues, and just with humanity writ large, we need to be more compassionate. So and then, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it all comes full circle to practicing mindfulness meditation by being in the moment. You can have compassion for others, but you can also develop that self-compassion, which I think is so important. Having that self-compassion for what it is you're experiencing, what it is you've been through, what it is you did or didn't do right or wrong having that self-compassion. And when you can start with that foundation, that self-compassion, you can start having compassion for others. And that's where having that language with your family, it's going to naturally come out. You're going to speak that language of compassion because you're living it. You're embracing it. It's part of you. I think that's uh, I think that's how I want to answer that question. I, I don't know if I fully answered it, but yeah. hopefully it did. That was great. Thank, thank you. And I, one last thing, one term I love that I told Jason Van Camp that he has when I had him on my show and you have it, the same exact thing, confident vulnerability. So yeah, it's like vulnerability can be seen as weak, but it's really yeah. a confident thing. So oh, thanks, yeah, brother. absolutely. Yeah. That's, that is Brene Brown's talk is why strength and vulnerability are basically the same thing. <laughs> she, I do have to drop this little joke. She talk, tells at the beginning of the talk, she says uh, that she uses the fact that she talks about shame, guilt, and vulnerability as kind of a, 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 a armor or a conversation starter, depending on who she wants to talk to or who she doesn't. So she gets onto a plane and she sits next to this person and she's like, Hey, or the person's like, what, what do you do? And she's like, oh, well, I talk about vulnerability and, and, and strength. And he's like, oh, two separate ends of the spectrum. And she's like, Bruh. she like draw, basically builds a wall in between her and that person because vulnerability and strength are on the same end of the spectrum. It takes a lot of strength to show vulnerability. There is no strength without vulnerability. And uh, uh, yeah, I just had to, that, that part of that TED talk always cracks me up. Uh, or maybe that's the Netflix special. I think it's the Netflix special. But anyway, anyway, it's uh, good stuff. John, if I could ask you real quickly along those lines of vulnerability, I've spoken about it a little bit in some of our groups. And it seems to me that um, it's a pretty tough deal to be vulnerable and open out to other people. And I agree with you 1000% that it comes from a place of so much strength. But with those of us and all of us have some sort of deep pains with some of the losses and things and, and, and things that we've dealt with in life. How do you advise people to 
uh, who are so willing to give and be vulnerable to other people to recognize that it's okay to be, and you touched on a little bit, to be vulnerable with yourself and that you're Mm -hmm. actually worth it. You owe it to yourself um, because so many people want to give, 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 uh, but we don't think that it's okay to give to ourselves and recognize that we are worth it um, and to be open and vulnerable to yourselves. Sure. Yeah. I'm certainly no expert in this, but I would say that a lot of the time, those people who are not willing to be vulnerable themselves are empaths. They, they, they take on the feelings and emotions that everybody else is feeling and they want to help. They want to help other people. But it's much like the, the old uh, saying when you get onto an aircraft and the, the flight attendant says, hey, in, in case of a loss of pressure, the oxygen mask is going to fall down. Put your mask on first so that you can take care of your kids, right? The natural instinct as a parent is to jump on that, that kid, put the mask on them and then come back. But if you do that, most likely you're going to pass out. Then you're not going to be able to take care of anyone. So what I would offer is if you're not offering yourself that vulnerability, if you're not offering yourself that compassion, uh, then you are eventually setting yourself up for some destructive emotions. Some of those purple threads that Abigail talks about, the negative self-talk that that you're setting yourself up for. And then because you're going to be less of a person than you could be, then you're not going to be able to be as supportive for the ones that you love. So take care of yourself, be compassionate for yourself, express that vulnerability because it is helpful to do. It's cathartic. And once you are taking care of yourself by doing that, then you're going to be able to serve others. So a lot of the time, those empaths, if you ask them what their why is, their why is to help other people, right? Something like that. That's what mine is. That's one of mine. And they have to realize that helping other people, you have to take care of yourself first so that you can help other people. If you're not, you're never going to be able to do the best job you can at taking care of others. So that's, that's my two cents on that. But again, I'm no, I'm certainly no expert on that. That's so powerful. Absolutely. That's so true. I mean, self-compassion yeah. is absolutely life-changing for the, the empath. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so, so needed. Um, you know, maybe we could go pop a run. I know his hand has been up for a while and then, then Tony, I think Tony wanted to talk too. So Papa Ron, did you want to go? John, um, thanks for uh, being up front. Um, my life has not been ne- nearly the same, however, exactly the same that what once I started, um, you know, showing the chinks in the armor, the weaknesses, uh, those became the strengths. And I've uh, having significant depression. Um, I I find now after working with it for years that the symptoms are now protective factors more than they are, uh, deficits that they warn, they, they advise, they lead. Um, and, and then you said something that that at the beginning, I want to get, ask you, um, two, two questions. I've heard leaders bring the weather. And so people take their emotional and physical and their response cues from the people that they look to. And obviously now you're in a position where people are looking to you. Uh, do you do, first, do you have an instance where some, where you have brought the temperature down for someone who was your, uh, your mini you or your <laughs> alter ego and the same, you know, your, your, your uh, that. And then you said at the beginning, the superstar. Because, I mean, Navy, SEAL, Commander, I mean, sometimes it's difficult to let being the superstar, you know, start believing your own press and all that wonderment that people may have about you or about me or about others in the room of how great we are and and then having to uh, to that humility of saying, uh, not much difference or how do you deal with that to keep that from from riding over the top and getting caught up into your own your own story or 
or celebrityism. I, I don't even know how to say it. Superstars, NFL players, professional athletes, celebrities, uh, you know, yeah. actors, a bit. Yeah. Um, well, I'll answer your first question first. Um, I have have two instances that jump to mind, um, if I understand the question correctly. Um, one, it's it's with my two-year-old son, uh, the mini-me, which is perfect because you even said that. Um, when he is <laughs> pitching his two-year-old terrible twos tantrums that he does, uh, my daughter did it before, um, taking a, a few breaths myself, and he sees that I do that, right? And then I put him on my lap and I do it in front of him. And then I can see that he's actually doing it. And this red face that he's had now starts to get some different colors into it rather than just red. And he calms down. My, my daughter is even better at it now. I mean, she's four years old now, um, but she's amazing. She, she will come up and she will be pitching her own little fit about, I don't know, if she, like this morning, she didn't have a bracelet that she wanted to go to school with. And we're like, hey, we can't find it, baby. We're just going to have to go to school. And, uh, and then she realized that there was no finding this bracelet. And she just, I watched her stand there and just take a few breaths. It was amazing. And she calmed down. So, um, you know, I, I consider myself and my wife, the leaders of the, we are co-leaders of the family. And uh, in that instance, my daughter and my son, both those instances, they have learned from me. They've also obviously learned incredible things from their mother and they're going to continue to. Um, but those are some instances there uh, in my family. As far as at work, uh, I had a boss who was definitely wired with the negativity bias, thought that the sky was falling all the time and caused himself a lot of anxiety and stress. And when he entered a room, that anxiety and stress was palpable and other people now had it on their shoulders. Um, but then I, had, uh, I, I did have an opportunity when I was starting to teach this mindfulness and meditation to sit with him and explain the science and everything that we've gone through here. And, and I could see that it was making changes in him. He was taking a pause in between a stimulus, like, hey, stimulus, thought, emotion, action. That's what we go through. And he was taking a pause after each stimulus. Whereas when we would brief him before, if it was something that was anxiety inducing, he would instantly jump and, and start stressing out and cause stress in the room. Then I could see he would get briefed on something, be briefed on something that would normally cause him to fly off the handle. And I could take, I could see even, uh, you know, two second pause in between that brief statement and then his statement. And that allowed him time to respond rather than react. Um, and I'm, Blanking on the second question, it has something to do with celebrityism. Um, Celebrity, <laughs> so. Being a superstar, I mean, being the absolute hero that you are. I mean, and and I say that with absolute, you know, humility. I mean, because you know, I, I don't know that just people that kind of glom onto you because of that. And how do you mm. how do you bring that down to say, you know, for me, I say I have feet of clay. I like that. I like that. So what I, um, <laughs> it's definitely easier now that I'm out of uniform now that, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely more to me in everybody's eyes than just having been a seal. Right. And, a, and a, not just a seal, but a, a seal. And, and when I'm, I, I forget who said it earlier, but somebody said I was just a Marine or I was just infantry. I, the, in my mind, there's no just. You served in the uniform. You put your right hand up and you swore to defend this country. I think that you are a hero in my eyes. Um, and that, I think, is what helps me to keep that humility is that we all volunteered to serve and we are all heroes. And that's I think what allows me not to get too wrapped up in that. The other side is <laughs> I used to go home and uh, to Louisiana. I grew up in Louisiana and my sisters, I would go to a, you know, a gathering, a barbecue with my sisters 
and they would introduce me. They're like, hey, th- this is my brother, the seal. And I was like, <laughs> you didn't even tell them my name. Like, <laughs> come on. I'm more, I'm more than just that. So anyway, it was uh, nice to change that now that I'm out of uniform and I've got something else. Uh, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son and brother. Uh, you know, I, I volunteer in the community. I think having other things where you are humble and you see, like when I volunteer, I'm learning day one. Like I walk into a volunteer situation where I have no idea what I'm doing and I see some other experts that'll make you humble real quick. And I, I think if you're willing to do that over and over and keep that, what we call a beginner's mindset, that uh, that keeps you from getting overly, uh, I don't know, celebrityized. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that. A great friend of mine, John Natchez, and he was co-founder of the National Stand Downs for Homeless Veterans. And I mean, he is an absolute confidant friend of mine. And he says, we're made up of so many parts. And there are so many parts about you, John, that we don't know and couldn't possibly know all of them. But those are probably as and sometimes more important than than the parts that people see uh, i don't know what are your thoughts about that oh yeah that's uh, <laughs> i mean just using the military analogy again you know we we so many so many of us wear a uniform and that's kind of the identity that so many of us wear when there is much more to us than that but at some point we even start to believe that the uniform is all that we are. And it really gets tough as we start to look to hang that uniform up when we put it like literally like the, the, when I hung my, my camouflage utility uniform up with the Navy steel trident U S Navy on it and all that other good stuff. I was like, I'm never going to put that uniform on again, not in an official capacity, not at all. And that's when it hit me. I was like, Oh, <laughs> I am John McCaskill. I am not just the Navy SEAL. Um, And again, I'm not just, I'm not using the word just as derogatory. I'm just saying that's just a piece of who I am. And it's a small piece. There's much more to me. And that's where I think um, that's how I get around it is realizing that when I take that uniform off, either literally or figuratively, there's much more to me than that. And, and under, understanding what that is, that can come with that mindfulness and meditation practice, yeah. like really doing some deep contemplative introspective work, identifying what makes you tick, what gives you joy, what fulfills you. That's, uh, that's how I keep that all in check. Yeah, to, to reframe C.S. Lewis words, you have a heart big enough to fill your chest. Right. That's great. Can I jump in for a second? Um, I think, Tony, d- did you have a last question? I think he was waiting for a little while. Was it Chris who just said something? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Tony, first, and then I, I'll, I'll step, step on what you were saying a second ago. All right. So um, I think a lot of people have kind of danced around what I was going to ask anyway. So um, I might be recapping, but I want to kind of hit it direct. Uh, you know, as far as you, John, you know, people um, respect you, love you, everything else. Uh, you know, yes, you were a seal, but again, you know, that not to discredit that, uh, but there was no John McCaskill, you know, when that was said, you know, you were a seal. It's just, just the community piece. Um, why we appreciate you and love you and, and respect you more than anything else is the space that you're in now, you know, sort of that bounce back, that resiliency piece that you're, that you're out there sharing and, and extremely vulnerable with. Um, and I, I appreciate more than, you know, uh, adding recently the, the operation red wing piece to it, you know, because I think that that puts a, an even more impactful validity, uh, to, to why you're bouncing back, why you're living in the space that you're living in now. Um, so I, you know, by all means, believe me, I, I appreciate more than, anything, uh, that story to, to, to put into that. So my question was more like toward other veterans or, or anybody really, um, that have sort of that dark space, you know, that, that dark anchor that sits inside and, and, you know, a lot of what I believe is that a lot of times the things that happen to us, um, tend to be sort of our credential to help others. Cause we do get into that service to others, uh, you know, mentality, and sure. so how do we end up or what is a best practice of turning that intrinsic hurt into an extrinsic healing? Mm. 
Yeah. I, I, honestly, I think that it's going to boil down to who you are uh, on the inside, right? And identifying who you are. Again, that comes back to the contemplative and introspective work that once you identify your why, if your why is service to others, which it is for so many service members, that's why we got into the service in the first place. I think once you can take that step back and identify that as part of who you are, part of your DNA, then, then you're going to take that, that hurt almost as, as an opportunity. Uh, again, coming back full circle to the, the obstacle is the way Ryan holiday, you see that, that hurt as a way to learn and grow and then take the lessons that you learn from that. And because you've done that deep introspective and contemplative work, you take those lessons and you want to share those lessons. I mean, that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? I've, I've had the, the, the hurt and, and I have learned from it. But now if I have those lessons and I don't share those, then what good am I doing? I'm not doing any good to anyone else and I'm not doing any good for myself. So I think that's where, that's where the, uh, the work is done. Again, it comes, comes back to practicing mindfulness, meditation, it, it, taking that, that hurt and turning it around into an opportunity to grow and learn and help others. John, do you have time for another question from Chris? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got time for one more. Sure okay. enough. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, okay. end us out. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed with how similar you are to my mindset as well. It's, it's really kind of giving me chills thinking about it. <laughs> um, it's an honor to, it's to talk to you. Um, the whole Red Wings thing, like Tony mentioned, is it, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest and most tragic story ever told. And it, it's just, it's fascinating to me, but going back to Ron's question about um, kind of breaking down what I refer to as that rock star status. Now, I, I kind of hope this resonates not in a negative way for other guys that have been through stuff. Uh, for me, um, surviving the worst gunfight of my life, that was where my vulnerability started. And that was when I realized that um, the, the effect that had on me is exactly what you're, what you're just talking about right now, where I've got to share that story and I'm now the vehicle for other people and, and coming full circle on that for my realization of what I had to deal with losing an officer on the street and <clears throat> breaking down that rock star status that, you know, you're walking around, you got your rifle, you're all cool with your helmet and everything else. And then you realize that you come this close to death and the survivor's guilt, exact same thing that I had to deal with. And now recognizing that, man, I've, I've got to share my stuff with other people just like you're doing and, and helping those guys out. That was for me, for, for your question, Ron, that's how I handled that. And I'm, I'm hoping this kind of resonates with some of the other guys that have been through something similar. So that's not really yeah. more of a smorgasbord. No, but you, you know, you're spot on though, because I mean, some of the, some of the healing happens in helping others. Some of the healing happens in helping others because you haven't even realized that you needed that help. Uh, sometimes some of the things that others are going through, you see that you're going through it or something similar, but you didn't even realize it until you're helping somebody else. So I think that, that that's where the, you know, the heart of service comes back is having that for the altruistic reasons. Sure. You want to help others, but there is personal benefit that comes from it you are going to help yourself by helping others uh, in the long run. So hundred percent, hundred percent agree, brother. Cool. Yeah. Thanks man. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. true. So true. And John is what, what do you want us to walk away with uh, from your mm. message? Uh, I, I think if you just walk away with love one another, uh, and I know that sounds kind of hippy dippy, but <laughs> honestly, I mean, if we can, if we can just show one another more compassion every day and then show yourself some compassion, walk away with, if you walk away from this with that and nothing else, then that's a win in my eyes. So, uh, definitely that's, that's what I love you all to walk away with. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, John, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. Um, my pleasure. Thank you an honor. Thanks everybody for joining this call and uh, we'll have the recording soon for this.
All right. Great. Thanks again, John. Take care. Thank you guys. Thank Appreciate you it. Bye-bye all. Take care.